Chris, what's going on, brother? Yo, what's going on, guys? How hey, you doing, we've man? got a friend of the show. He says he listens to the show, and he told me a couple times when I was backstage in AW and W N W A, but my bad, NWA, uh, yeah. NWA um, that you know he wanted to come on the show and possibly. Uh, maybe even debate you. So if there's a, something you can think of, Chris, that you you don't agree with Disco, I'm sure he'll be happy to um, oblige. Yes. But no, w- I, welcome I, to the I, show. Thank you. Thank you. No, I usually agree with you guys. You got to understand, yeah. I'm a little closer to you guys' era, than, I think, than even the current stuff. So when I hear you guys, I hear Jim Cornette. I mean, it's just psychology. It only makes sense to me what you're talking about. I'm just hearing you talk about the AEW thing and like, that splash scenario just sounds cringeworthy because it's Sting. He hasn't made his way to the corner. And when you're working guys like Sting or, you know, any of that group of guys that are still working, your responsibility as much, if not more, to have a good match with them is to take care of them. Right, right. Because I've wrestled a few of them within the last couple of years. And I'm not going to say names because you might get angry. But, right. Um, you know, I, I always look at it like that. You've got to take care of these guys. And, like, it just seems so amateur for somebody to go in and still go for a splash before the guy even has a chance to set up on me. Like, what are we doing? What yeah, are right, we doing? Right. I know. I'm watching. It's like, you know, yeah. It's like, but let me ask you a question because you're more closer to this generation than we are, even though you're more in the middle. But what, why do you think, or where do you think the disconnect happened when it went from, you know, just a lot of logic and psychology to a lot of just, kind of high flying and no psychology and thigh slapping and like the, like we're seeing now, because maybe do you think that they, they got so many people from the Indies that weren't really ready instead of people that were, you know, had been in the business for a while, like they used to before, or what do you think? That my that's might be part of it, but a part of it might just be how society is so like into clips and reels now and like the, you know, which really centers around like uh, flashy high spots. But, um, you know, I, it had to happen somewhere within the last decade, I think, because I know that when I entered the business around 2005, 2006, what mattered to us most was people not seeing through our work and the believability and psychology. That's all we cared about. The high spots were always, they're always going to be there, but they weren't such a uh, prominent part of the matches. And we weren't neglecting so much of the other stuff because I just feel like, honestly, the art, I mean, sure, you can be entertained by um, high spots, but the art of wrestling is kind of being lost a little bit when you're not trying to, you know, Nick Aldis said this, I always give him credit for this, because, you know, one thing I think that will never change in pro wrestling, because we talk about the evolution of wrestling, evolution of basketball, all these other things, but in wrestling, the suspension of disbelief is always going to be, or it should always be the number one thing in what we're doing, you know what I mean? I believe, yeah. and when Nick said that, it just made sense. So you can talk about how wrestling has changed and it's evolved and it's different, but still, that is the number one prerogative here. And uh, I think we maybe have got away from that a little bit. And I think we're like really a lot. We got away from a lot, a lot. A lot. Right here, that's, yeah, that's like it's, it's, it's noticeable, right? Here's where it really affects us, and I think you guys have touched on this. I don't think about us or the wrestling fans in the bubble. I think about the casual people flipping through who now go to TBS. And they see 10 guys waiting outside the ring for a dive. And what are, what are they thinking when they see that? They're thinking two things. They're either thinking these 10 guys on the floor are idiots or this is phony. And like people like, you know, the whole point is, is to, you know, not, not let it be that, you know what I mean? For people to believe in it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, people right. don't you don't show, them. you don't show, you don't show Iron Man the CGI while he's flying, you know? Right. Yeah, we want to make it look. Tr- and we're not even trying to hide from the fact that it's worked out, but it still means that when you go out there, it's like our whole and and our whole vested interest is to get like these people to something in the match to get them to buy it, and then to to build upon that as you go on throughout the match, and then you tell a good story. Bro, I tweeted right. out a, 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 one of these like ridiculous spots where choreographed looking and stuff and thing, and I'm like. Like I said, there was a clip, and I'm like, well, why are people like the, the funny thing is like wrestling fans today, and even like the AEW uh, social media people will tweet out like the phoniest looking spots. Like on the AEW site, they'll, they'll tweet out the spot where they're showing Moxley blading himself, and they'll put that in like I watch it, and I'm going like, what are you like? Like I said, like dude, we're not. You don't do that. You don't want to just tell the people, hey, this is fake, but we're self mutilating ourselves on a show. And then that's why we're bleeding. Did you see that? Did you see that, Chris? 
Um, I heard about the, the blading that got caught on camera, yeah. right? Bo- bo- just, right. Bo- just, right. So you, just so you guys know, like my generation, we talk about this stuff all the time. So it's not just you guys. And we talk about the ponds. I, I just had a conversation about this um, recently where I just I'm optimistic that it's gone very far the other way. But I think it will actually roll back a little bit and maybe we'll meet in the middle and maybe all that other stuff will be emphasized more because uh, I think it matters. And it's important because the, all this stuff, this is the art form. High spots is not the art form. Dives is not the art form. Uh, you know, pods is all that stuff. It's about, you know, sprinkling that stuff in, you know, what I mean, at the right times when it makes sense in the context of the match of the story. And like, I don't think we'll get back to that. Like, I don't, cause I don't think you can sustain this. I don't think that like, I don't even think it's going to be entertaining for the long run. You know what I mean? Cause you have to be, go back to stories, right? You can't just have these car wrecks and dives and, and matches, cold matches that are just good wrestling matches out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let me ask you something because I'm glad you're here. Cause I always have this discussion with, with, with disco. He knows like, Oh, well that, that Lucha spot, you know, looks fake or looks funny or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but in Mexico, they like it. That's how they've been educated. You've wrestled in Mexico. Am I not right? Oh, yeah, I just appro- yeah, I just approach it completely different when I go to Mexico. And, I, you know, I learned it on the fly. I was out there for a trios match um, on my first indie run. And I was out there with, uh, I don't know if it was L.A. Park or La Parca. You know, the OG, but, you know, he broke out and danced which, in the middle of the match. The one, which was the one from WCW, Conan? L.A. Park or La Park? The one he's talking about. L.A. Park. Yeah. Yeah. LA Park, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was just, it's just, it's just different. It's like, it's not, for me, it's still funny because when I go to, go to Mexico and I come back from uh, the match, I still don't know what, if it's a good match or not. I mean, I know I had fun, but it just feels so different from what we do in the States. Yeah, like, yeah, they're not as much about like the psychology is completely different it's just the whole ebbs and flows of the like the six man matches or the trios whatever we call it now so i mean i just i throw everything i know out the window when i go to mexico and i just listen and uh, see kind of where i fit into stuff you know i uh, here's i'm gonna give you two things I mean, you can do, do, enter this discussion too because i'm gonna put this to Cody. in I, I i there's two glaring things about lucha that i don't think would re- resonates over here in, in right. the structure of like a suspension discipline can keep it special right. release. Two, two spots they do that are staples of lucha spots I, i'm just not a fan of number one is when you just you just run forward and the guy just sidesteps and just like you know just like like you just run right by the guy okay right. he thought it, he he, he kind of it, it yeah. right but the, but the thing is yeah. is like it's not it's done very lazily because all you'd have really have to do is just wait till the very last second until the guy's about to hit you and then real quickly sidestep the guy and do it. But they just like because it's such a common spot, you just see the guy just running and the other guy's getting out of the way and just let him run right by and it's like and I'm not watching go like, bro, you can tighten that up and, and let make that work. Would you would you agree with that, Cody? That's one spot. Yeah, but but it's but it, they've been seeing it for so many years. They're educated on that, and they don't think like you. You're seeing it right. for the first time, and you're like, oh, okay, maybe you should do this. But they've been seeing it since they right. were little, and, and they've already accepted it. And yeah. That's the thing. The fans have accepted it. So you go with it. You don't try to change it. Yeah. That's my point. In Mexico, yeah. the fans have accepted that. That's part right. of the like, – we, we accept right. lucha. We, we're, we're still into it. Right. They still suspend right. disbelief in Mexico, and actually some of them still think it's pretty real, right? Right. But um, And the second thing that everybody's doing these days, I'm not – Fan of, bro. Like, if part of the skill of being as luch is you can jump up and down on the ropes, I right. don't like if, you, if too much of that over course of the wrestling show looks like a circus. You know, right. like if you have the one guy doing it, that's like his gimmick. Boom, boom. But like you know, when three or four or five or six guys are jumping from the second rope to the third rope, that and I, I do it all that. It's just like, okay, guys, we get it. You guys are acrobats. You can do this thing, but like, if all of you are acrobats and nobody, re- none of you really stick out. You know what I'm saying? So that's that. Those are the two things that I don't think resonate with the American audience, like like it does in Mexico. You know, and I would say just have the one guy that does that or the two guys that do that. But, but you know, having everybody jump up and down in the ropes just looks absurd to me. So I don't know. Like if you did a sidestep in America, like you, you would really have to put some body into it. You know what I mean? Right. For, and I still, it's kind of hard for me, me to buy, but I see what K Dog's saying because I know it's just, it's like, it's just a common thing. It's just like, it's Lucha hey, sidestep right. is what we would call it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And the other one, yeah, where you, just you like, to- it's no different than in the United States. Drop down, leapfrog, tackle. What, what logic does that make? You know, if you're seeing it for the first time, but it's a staple of American wrestling, and it's accepted 
And in that universe, it's, 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 you know, it's believable. Yeah. I will say, K-Dog, as a baby face, I do look for any opportunity for that drop down to actually right. work for me. So I like I do right. make I do make an effort to make that actually a legit maneuver. Yeah. And it usually gets a pop if you put it in the right spot. Chris, how right. old are you? You don't look uh, like just, you I, I when I saw you in LA, remember that? How how random was that? Remember that time when okay. So Kakoda, I was in LA randomly. This is maybe like twelve this is a long time ago. This is yeah, wow, now. twelve, thirteen years ago, maybe? Like, you know, yeah. and I was in Vegas and I I had friends in LA, so I went to just went to LA for a couple of days, right? Yeah. And uh and freaking um he uh I I pull up master came in at the rainbow room. I can't know in the rainbow Who was room. Who was I with? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, hey, hey, there's a patio. Okay, there's a patio out there, right? And when you walk up, like the line to get in is like right next to the patio. No, I've been there. Okay, so there's a line. So there's like there's like six or seven people in line. I get in line, and there's a fence, and on the table right next to me, the fence. I just look over. Chris Masters, X Pack, and uh, and Ryan Shamrock. And I'm like, right. and, and X Pac and Ben Masters are smoking, smoking, smoking blunts. That's <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. Like, you know, so like, you know, so I was like, oh man, what's going on? So we we hung, we hung out. I walk inside, and Chuck Zito's in there. That's I've been that's Chuck Zito. It's like the first. It's wow. the, bro, literally the first time in like ten years I'd been out in L.A. and I just randomly ran into three. three like the first place I went to, ran into, ran into four people. Bro, how funny! How funny is this? About that same time, okay. I don't know how or why I ended up in the rainbow room, but I did. And as I'm going in, sitting outside, probably in the same place you're talking about, is X-Pac and um, Be Real from Cypress Hill smoking. And I'm like, what the, awesome. what's, what, what's going it. on here? And I, I go, you it. guys can, you, and I didn't know you could smoke in California. And I go, hide that shit. Cause it was all on the fucking table. I go, bro, hide that shit. And they were like, no, it's cool. You, I got a medical marijuana card. I go, it's like, what, what is that? How do you even get that? And guess who was inside? Chuck Zito. Yeah. Were you, were you like, hey, by the way? Me or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I'm from here. You know, it's funny though. You rolled You're up from so Santa Monica, aren't you? Yeah, I was born in Santa Monica. Grew up yeah. on the west side out here, West LA. But um, yeah, you know, Disco, the way you rolled up so casually, I just figured you were kind of rolled up there all the time. It was just funny that that was just the one time you happened to be in LA in ten years, and I'm just like, how was how did this happen? Because it was like a Monday night, and it's like, where are you going to Monday night? It's like, let's go to the Rainbow Rooms. So yeah. I, 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 cool. I need to get back there. I haven't been there in ages, and I keep telling myself, so like, I don't know. It just sounds how, fun. Let me ask you a question. How, how old are you? I, I just turned 40 in January. Yeah, because you look like, I was going to say, you look young. You don't look like you've, you've aged. You've been aging you well. Know, I take, well, you know what? I've started, I've been taking care of myself better than I ever did in my 20s and 30s. You know, you give realize. Me, give me this example. Diet and exercise. Oh, Oh, diet and exercise. Uh, you know, I work out basically every day, five days a week. I go in like today. I worked out twice. I did cardio for forty minutes after doing weight training in the morning. Like I'm more motivated than I've ever been. You know, it's just it's unfortunate because you wish you could have this mind when you're 25, 30, and all that. But you know, now at forty, I just kind of realize that like you know, I ain't gonna be wrestling forever. And whatever I do now, uh, you know, I gotta put my best foot forward. You know what I mean? I like there's no time to mess around there's no time to you know lay back so i'm just you know nwa has been a great opportunity it's been a platform where i can you know do that i've tried to evolve uh from who i am you know i think my work i guarantee you my work is better than it's ever been and the way i move in the ring so um yeah man i'm just i just taking care of myself better than ever you know like, you, so, you do a lot of international tours right yeah yeah i went to pakistan in december uh, i'm going to israel in no August. but weren't you and me on the same tour in sudan when they told us to leave the country because yeah. wasn't it you yes yeah. yes yeah, yeah i remember yeah. we had a uh, yeah that was that freaked us out we didn't know if we were safe or not like that was a pretty right. wild What's sudan and nigeria huh? tell this tell this story i, I want to hear this story you what know happened? i i don't remember all the details but i remember what was it uh or then, like didn't an american representative i forgot what you call him you know, there's a tag. Like a liaison. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember some girl went up to you that worked there, right? Yeah. No, yeah, we were lining up to do an appearance, and she came up to me out of everybody right. in line, and she uh, had warned me about, I forgot, would you remember what I said that she said? Yeah, she was, she was saying that, do you want to, we don't, you, you don't have relations with the United States. 
you know? And if something happens, we don't have your back and you shouldn't be here. And we were like, fuck that. We came here to make money. So whatever happened is going to happen. We, we did come here to turn back. That's for damn oh, sure. No, you weren't the only one with that mindset. We all were. Yeah. It's funny though, because I don't know. I feel like I'd be a little more concerned nowadays about it. I guess I'm more. No, no, nah, nah, you, no, nah, no, nah, you were, you, because you, I remember you came in, you told me and the group of guys, and we we're like, yeah. fuck that, bro. We don't give a fuck. We're here to make money. And that's yeah, what we did. Yeah, you know? yeah, because yeah. we, you know, we're kind of used to seeing weird situations. Not, not to that right. extent, not having somebody from the States warn us, but like, I always yeah. think back, you know, the two weirdest kind of shows I ever did was that one that you said, Sudan, and then I think it was Nigeria. And those right. were, uh, you know, just very. What, uh, what happened in Nigeria? The Nigeria oh, you know, shows, the, Chris. Is that the ones that uh, Cabana and Cliff Compton always talked about? Probably, but I think Barb booked them. And like the thing that always stands out to me is we went to one of those religious healing things where the guy went around like touching people, and they went into convulsions, and uh, you know, talk, and then you know, we basically saw uh, how the whole thing was a work. You know, how all these people just bought into it, and uh, I don't know, it was just. It was very eye opening, and you know, parts of obviously the country are very undeveloped, so to speak. Right. So you know, you just saw stuff that you would, you know, you go to places like that, and you realize what, why there is American pride and patriotism. Right. It is. You, you mean know, like people barefooted or like you know with, with little clothing on and shit? Oh yeah, we saw people like fighting in dirt for uh, money. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. wrestling in dirt and right. people just spectating. Like yeah, weird stuff like you know people showering in the street or bathing in the street and stuff. Right. I mean, saw that saw that in India too. So I mean, you just you know you really come to realize how lucky you are to be born in a country like this. Even for all its faults and all everything everybody wants to complain about, you could have been born somewhere like that. And you know it's a very uphill climb. Let, you know? let me ask you a question because one time I was talking to Ray and his, his wife Angie. And she was telling me that when she went to India, it was like the dirtiest place she'd ever been to. Was it was it really dirty where you were? I don't say dirty. I say it's the dustiest place I've ever been to. It's okay. like, you know how, how you do explain it is like, like anywhere, like just look around wherever you're at right now and just imagine just dust basically. Oh, well, that's kind of dirty. Yeah. It just, I don't know what it is. And maybe it's just where they're located or something. And you like might've been on, you might've been on that trip. Cause she said it was WWE went there and like a whole bunch of people got sick. No, I only went outside of WWE, but I will say uh, to, to, to your point, I haven't, you know, I went there with Harry Smith for, uh, with Harry Smith and me shared a room for Rinka King that Jeff Jarrett had put right. on back in 2010. And I swear Harry Smith got so sick that I still say to this day, I have never seen anybody more sick than I saw Harry that morning. Like he was literally right next to the phone and he did not have the energy to pick it up and call emergency or a doctor. He looked me, he looked at me and basically pleaded with me to call a doctor for him. And like, I couldn't, I was in shock. Cause I mean, again, he's right next to the phone. So I'm, but then I realized like, Oh, he's not kidding. And he spent the, you know, the next three days in the hospital and it was pretty miserable. Like, I don't even think he'll ever go back to India. And, uh, you know, you hear stories about this, and you know how it happens a lot of times is people know not to drink the water and stuff, but I don't know, maybe you get a drink with ice in it, and then, you know, a lot of hell breaks right. loose. Like, Regal almost died. You know what I mean? Like, if he, I've been gone there several times and had no issues, uh, knocked on wood, but um, I have seen a were lot you, of people. Were you on this uh, Australia trip they just did with NWA? No, no, that was, uh, they brought like kind of a smaller crew for that, you know what I mean? They right. brought like uh, yeah. Terry Morden came in for that, and uh, you know, so it was, and then, oh, uh, what's his face? Real Billy when came in. So I was just a smaller crew, but I mean, it looked like a lot of fun. I, I know a lot of those guys have never been to Australia, so they look like they were having the time of their lives. You know, Americans love Australia. And how, how is it, would you say this guy is bad or very bad manager? Pat Kenny, a.k.a. Simon Diamond. <laughs> is he in the chat or something? Or are we live? Yeah, he's a, he's not, he's a... He's a friend of the show that we constantly bust his balls because, he, as you know, he's a huge Notre Dame mark. Okay. Oh God! Yeah, oh, yeah. He and and a huge sports. Yankee fan. Yeah. Oh, but he's also, you know, he'll, hey, I'm sure he's gone into the who's the best point guard in uh, basketball history with you, right? Uh, he has not second? gone over that issue. Oh, not, he, no, he has not. That's it. That's his favorite topic around NBA. Right. And if you answer anything but Magic Johnson, he will have your ass. But like. Oh, uh, right. with, it was fun to actually hear him and Nature Boy d debate that because Nate, you know, I think Pat thought that Nate was going to go to Magic, and Nate actually right. went to Steph Curry, and then the debate that ensued after was just very entertaining. 
Right. No, I can imagine. Who do you think's a better point guard? Uh, you, uh, you know, that's, that's tough. I'm, I'm biased, man. I'm in LA. You right, know, you're a Laker, yeah. You're a Laker, yeah. I, I can't not say magic, but at the same time, I will give Steph his props. I mean, think about it. Like, Steph did change basketball. He was such a great three-point shooter that now it's become the way people kind of, you know what I mean? He's kind of opened people's eyes to possibilities that they may have not even thought. You know, we're true, right. like these half-court well, shots with, and stuff. Well, with the three-pointer, the center is no longer important. And he used to be the main guy. It's almost like in football, whole teams revolved around running backs. Now they're getting cut left and right. Well, with the exception of like, shoot, if you look at the look at what the Nuggets did, Joker is just, I don't know, he's, he's something incredible. different. Yeah, but the difference, yeah. I guess, with him is is he's a center and basically a point guard all in one. I mean, maybe, maybe he's, like, he's like this weird hybrid of everything because he's such a great he's, facilitator. He's a bigger, bigger version of Larry Bird. Is the best, yeah. best, best way. He plays very similar game, great passer, but, but he's like 30, right. 40 pounds heavier. Like Not three, super four, athletic. Four, like, yeah, right. Right. He does more. He does his, his facilitating from like the free throw line and stuff where uh, Larry would cover more ground, I think, right? I I think the best point guard, and, and the true point guard, but the reason he was the best point guard during, during, that I've seen, what I thought was Steve Nash. Because as still as a point guard, he was the best three-point shooter, best shooter, and the best free-throw shooter in the NBA, and he, like, led the league in assists, right? And he was kind of like the gold standard until Steph came along and basically was doing the same thing Nash was doing, but doing it, like, three or four feet back on the three-pointers from where, from where Nash was doing. You know, like, that. Like remember that, like, bro, nobody was jacking three-pointers from three, four, five feet behind the line like the NBA players are doing right now. You were just right on the line, you know, shooting threes, and, like, you you, you, like bro, you get benched. Was, you know, you would get benched if you did that. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's taking a process to get here. Like, because coaches, right. if, you, if someone just does that, you are going to sit down if you do a couple of those. But now we've gotten to the point where some guys have the green light to do that. And it's okay. So, um, yeah, very much. I think the best guard maybe that I ever saw, well, Jordan was a guard, obviously, right? And right. Uh, Allen Iverson. Yeah. Yeah. Are, man. Yeah. Um, what Iverson and Iverson and Kobe, man, like you know, you wouldn't put them in the goat debate, but man, they like they changed the culture of NBA too, man. Those two guys, you know what I mean? Like Kobe doesn't even need the Kobe Michael thing. Don't even matter, man. Kobe's like his own thing, and you know, Michael's the goat. That's fine, but you know what I mean? Like I don't know, I, you know, basketball fans like to pit everybody against each other so much, you know. Who are you? What are your uh, your, your sports fit? Obviously, who are, who are your teams? Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I'm not, you know, mainly basketball. You know what I mean? Uh, like, right, I've, right. I've never been diehard into, like, LA's never had a football team until recently, I guess. Now. Right. And, uh, you know, I like baseball growing up. I like the Dodgers. But, like, baseball, I, I like what they're doing now because I really feel like baseball needs to increase the pacing a little bit. Because yeah. with this generation, we do not have the patience for it. And then when you put the amount of games that they have, Really, all it does from a fan standpoint is dilute the game because, like, each game doesn't matter for shit. You know what I mean? Oh, you, you know what's, what's, here, right? with, with, you know what's weird? Hmm. What's weird that the my young pretties, the young buckaroos, uh, Nick and Matt, they're Clipper fans. Are they really? Why? Why? I don't know. <laughs> why did you? Why did you? Okay, see, like, <laughs> and I think there's road. more. But like, I get passionate about this. What has that franchise given you outside of a crappy owner, Donald Sterling, who was like all these right. terrible things? What have they given you? They haven't even given you a Western Conference championship. Like, how can you? I just don't understand it. Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. Like, what, it's literally, it just has to be to be contrarian to the Lakers or something. Because, again, I would understand if they gave you something to celebrate. But all they've right. given in you is heartbreak and failure and bad ownership before Bomber. So, like, if, but here's the thing. If you want to jump on board with Bomber because you like him or maybe you like Kawhi now, okay, I get it. But hey, before that, really? Really? Yeah. 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 Well, my mind. I, read a, I read a great book on uh, just all their failings and stuff. It's called The Curse. The uh, yes. Curse one. And chaotic history of the Clippers by this guy Nick uh, Minus or whatever, but and it continues yeah, it to play cool. out though. Yeah, it continue. Look at this year, like they put everything on the table for Kawhi and PG, and look what's happened. Like Kawhi gets hurt in the second game in the first round. Yeah, <laughs> and the Lakers, meanwhile, go all the way to the Western Conference, and they just threw together a team just a couple months ago because they had you know the Westbrook trade and all that. So right. I don't know. The Cooper curse just has to be real. Palmer seems like a good guy. He's a little annoying, but I do like the fact that a, a guy that's that rich 
can't just come in and buy an NBA championship, honestly, because that something about that was, you know, occurred to me. Right. Um, so how's it been? How has it been working with a uh, Billy Corrigan? Oh, cool, man. Like, you know, Billy, I love the fact that I, uh, he gives a, you know, he doesn't want like, for instance, when we have promos and stuff, he doesn't write it word for word for Batum. You know, he gives you an idea, but you have a lot of freedom to kind of go out there and uh, develop your stuff and say your words, say your piece or, or kind of, you know, direct your character in certain ways. So I, I don't know. I just, I enjoy that part because it's been, um, fun for me like when i do promos i feel like they've got a lot better in the last year because i just focused on making sure i believe the verbiage that's coming out of my mouth and right like, you know, that's never, the most I, important thing and i you know i, I never think i'm going to be the rock or anything like that but as long as i can deliver promos that like i watch myself and i can see like oh i believe this and like my voice and there's conviction in my voice and all that like i'm, I'm happy with that because like you know I, I gear myself towards what mattered to me as a wrestling fan when i was a kid and what mattered to me like promos matter but to me it was more about like you know the way guys moved in the ring you know what i mean like i love like the way hbk mr perfect all those guys sold and it was also about like you know like just looking cool like looking like an action figure like having cool shit but okay so um chris yeah i don't even know how to um sorry i said a lot <laughs> No, 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 no. It's, it's it's absolutely cool. No, I had something right now, but I'm, uh, uh, you know, Cody gets high my... and he forget he loses his train of thought right. quite often during this. But and the funniest thing oh. about this is, people complain that I talk too much on the podcast, and I say, well, who's who else was supposed to read the stuff? The guy that's in Iran or Joe? So, you know, so like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I mean, I got I, I do all the reading. You know, and then Conan, like we have our little our cadence here where I say my thing and Conan finishes up every, every talk. K-Dog, K-Dog, we, yeah. you know, you and me have partakes before, so I, I get it. You know what right. I mean? Like, uh, yeah. if we, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, so if you guys have uh, any more, we can keep going or if not. We no, no, the up. funny, the funny, no, I remember uh, what I was going to ask you. So you could tell Disco, tell him that funny story when we were in the airport together and I think it was immigration or something it was a oh really long line. And I busted out the thing. I still, Oh my God. I K dog was rocking this cane and I hadn't seen him in a long time. So like, I'm just like looking at him like, Oh shoot, man. Like he's pretty grizzled. Like, I don't know what's happened. Like, well, I didn't remember him like this. And you know, he's working it, working it, working it. I think we got up and we started talking too. And, um, I think we get right outside of what is it baggage claim? You know, he's still right. working and doing the limp, and all of a sudden he picks up the uh, cane and he just like he like whips it, and the whole thing like folds in, and then he just starts walking like normal. And I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I like he literally, I like I don't know, I just I'd never seen that before, and it got him through all the. I think you took me with you, right? We got through all these lines yeah. and stuff. And yeah, I was just, yeah. No, I. I you know, it's funny how, you know, you guys will relate to this. I, I've been wrestling, shoot, 20 years now. And, like, there's a lot of stuff you don't remember. But then there's things like that that just, yeah. I don't know, they yeah, stick you. Yeah, you can't forget. You know? Yeah, you know, they right. just, they, they pop you or it's the first time you see Because I remember you came up to me. He goes, what was that? And I go, hey, we didn't have to stand in line. And you just popped. Yeah. Oh, good. bro. I, yeah, no, I never, I told that story a couple of times I had to, and, uh, you know, I just really appreciated all the stuff I would learn from guys like you. Not necessarily that. Cause I don't think I could yeah. pull that off, but like right. I learned stuff from you, Ray, I'm sure disco, if I was on the road with you, I would probably learn a lot from you, but it was always fun to learn these little life hacks on the road from you guys, you know, the stuff that, you know, was actually usable, but, right. um, yeah, I really, I just, I enjoyed that stuff, man. It was, it was fun, you know, because you know, everybody's always so caught up in the wrestling and the wrestling, but they don't even know about all the other stuff, you know, that you have to learn travel wise and, you know, just the that whole process. So, um, which is hard for me because I, I mean, I started at 20, so I didn't even, you know, I was barely in I know, bro. You started super young. I didn't know you had started with Rick Bassman. Yeah. Yeah. I started with Rick and, uh, there were a lot of people there, right? Like Samoa Joe, Chris Daniels, like, Cena, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of people that came from there. You know what? The first day I went in there, you know who was in there? It was like mind blowing. Uh, Antonio Anoki was in there. Right. The first day I went there, like I remember, and I was only 16. You know, I started training wow. for a couple. Well, I started training for a couple of months, and I got hurt. I fractured my ankle, so like I right. had surgery, and then I took a two year layoff before coming back. But when I came down there that time, it was like a who's who. Like you just never knew. 
who was going to show up. I remember RVD showing up one day randomly and he got in the ring and like, you know, Cena and me started. I think we started exactly the same day. I, you know, I could be wrong, but we, you know, literally Cena and me got our starts together. But then, you know, again, I got hurt, took the layoff, and then Cena went about, you know, he got signed and, you know, went on about the WWE. I remember the uh, Hall and Nash teamed up randomly on a, on a U- UPW show, but it was like the first time they had teamed in a while. Did you, were you on the show with those guys? I'm trying to, do you know what year that was? I think it Probably was after. 2003, maybe? Yeah, I think I had just got signed. I think I maybe had been gone for about okay. a year at yeah. that point. I got signed somewhere around like 2003, maybe the end. And then uh, I think they might've came in after that. But like, yeah, like it was a who's who, man. Like, you know, I'm some more Joe, like you said, I'm trying to think, you know, Miz came out of there and Cena, obviously. And, you know, I don't know, hardcore kid, Aaron Aguilera, if you remember him, Conan. And What happened to him? Well, he broke his neck, man. And then I uh, like, oh, is that what happened? Yeah, very early on, man. He had a lot of promise and stuff, but I think after that, he was just kind of looked at as a liability by the company, unfortunately, and never, you know, and he didn't have enough uh, equity yet and all that stuff. So I just, I don't know, it just kind of didn't pan out. Like, I don't know all the details, but I know obviously that was a major thing, uh, which is very unfortunate. Now, I don't now if, I remember, if I remember correctly, were you released from WWE because he had failed the substance abuse program or something like that? Yes. Yes. Now, what I was had, it? Weed or the juice? No, no, it wasn't either. It was uh, I, had yeah. prescri- I had a prescription pill issue around that time. Right. That had, de- right. had de- developed like a lot of money. people did. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But mine was like extreme. Like mine. Well, was it was, somas? Oh yeah. Like I was right up there with you know Kurt Angle numbers, and I'm not proud of it. Right. But, but right. like you know, I always look back and I'm like, man, I should have died, and I spent like so much money on that stuff. But um. I'm gonna blame we, Conan, I'm gonna blame Conan for this the soma issue because right. the, Conan brought the Mexican wrestlers to WCW. I remember they would bring yeah. up all the pills. Yeah, pill, right. Right. The bottle of pills from Mexico. So we get them cheap, <laughs> right? Because you can't do it like over the counter down there, right? Yeah. yeah it's, well, one thing I will say though, like about like uh, you know this generation now is it is, and this coming from a guy who used to be into that stuff, um, it's really nice to not have the drug addicts in the locker room right. and people 100%. Pass around. and like right. honestly honestly like yeah there's a lot of great stories from that era and all that and there's a lot of great stuff about that era but that's kind of one of the, i mean you guys had we all have had friends and peers and some people who have died and it just got and it just it really got um but when i think back to it now man it was just like not a good scene in the locker room you know having guys uh itching right. for pills and you know right kind of shaking, shaking, shaking the in bottle. the hall yeah. shake well, you don't yeah. gotta shake the bottle, and then everybody would look up. You know, there was that whole deal. Right. You know, you do that nowadays, and nobody even flinches. Or you'd you see guys mean? walking in the hall shaking. And yeah, I remember yeah. one time our good friend, brother from another mother, um, Norman Smiley, um, uh, had told me that he saw Bobby Duncan, and he go, and he'd never seen a right. guy shaking on somas. You know, the first time I saw it, I freaked out. And uh, and he was shaking. He goes, "Hey, man, you're shaking." And that Bobby Duncan goes, "That's what you want." Right. <laughs> that's what you want. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, yeah. It's scary. Right, and, you know, the scary, the scariest yeah. thing I ever saw, just real quick, was uh, you know, I had been deep into it myself, and you know, you don't see yourself, and you don't realize how bad it is. But I remember I, I was in Europe, and I came downstairs one day, and I saw Test, and he right. was right in the middle of his soma shakes, and it was just, and he was sitting with civilians at a table. Right. You know what I mean? Like regular. Oh people. my God. They must have been was, freaking out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare, you know, to wake up to that. And then he was so big that I just, I, I knew right then and there how awful it had been for my ex-girlfriend and my ex-ex-girlfriend to deal with me when I saw, when I had to deal with tests. And luckily I had Sandman helping me of all people. But, right. um, yeah, it was not, you know, we had to get him out of there. Bro, I remember... The, the one, th- the first time that I saw somebody like really messed up was me and Ray Mysterio had gone to eat with Nash and the Steiners and um, uh, Hall. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, Hall, uh, Nash had been taking H bombs, you know, the Halcyon. And he just went face first into his soup. Yeah, Boom. That's Bro, uh, that's, well, well, that, isn't that funny? Yeah. So the H bombs and when the GHB. Remember yeah, the, I saw the, Kevin Sullivan on GHB knocked out. Yeah, and, and I always used to tell like the, the, there was like a, a, a common thing 
the boys would go out to like a Denny's or a Waffle House afterwards, and there'd be like you know two or three tables worth of guys, and everything. And the next thing you know, you'd be looking at one, one of the guys f- f- fell asleep in his soup. Is what we right. call it. Like there's always like right. one guy who's just like out, you know, like in fact, right. like passed out in his food. You know, it's like I was, we had like, is, you know, we had to quit that, you know. You know, this is one thing I, I just want to say though too. When I look back on that too, what's sad about it is. All of us, you know, spending how many hours of our life did we spend right. or did we waste that, right. you know, for that hour that you were messed up and you passed out, like you'll never get. Or hours never, or hours or what, yes, that you're not hours. productive. But yeah. it's also like, it's basically when I look back at all those hours, they're just hours that never happened in my life that I didn't either better myself or grow. I just was passed right. out. They, and that, at those couple hours never happened because I was passed out and like not coherent. Or even just times where, where, where you're conscious and you well, know, the, people around you are making memories, but you're not going to remember a damn thing. About oh, yeah. Like, know, I'm so foggy. You know, it's sad because when I look back at my WWE career, I do remember a lot, but there's so much that is so foggy. And I Me, think, you know, it's, the travel is one thing, but it's from that. Go ahead. I always used to joke with Raven that, you know, the, those were our, our lost years. Yeah. That's what we call them. <laughs> Seriously. But, um, Yeah. But, you know, it was weird. It was it was hard because, you know, I'd never done anything before I came into the business. And I said, I'm never going to do anything. But, bro, when you're on the road 30 days straight with all that pressure and the politics and you got to get up and you need something to take down and everybody around you is doing it, that's in the car, you just end up saying, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? And so everybody was really high most of the time, fucked up, you know, because there was so much fucking uh, pressure, you know, you know, the pressure. Oh, and I was super impressionable. I mean, think about it, coming right. in at 20 years old. And I, I did the right. same thing you did, Conan. I was clean and never right. did anything. And then I got to OVW. And, you know, I don't even right. think WWE knew, but OVW had become like a breeding ground for uh, drug addicts. And it's not that right. WWE had done that. It's just somebody had right. come in there and smartened up to the boys to prescription pills. Because I'll never forget when I first got my eardrum ruptured and I went to the hospital. And the next day I came in and everybody was asking me, about what I got for the pain, and I had no idea what, why they even cared. But you know, I right. learned very quickly. Right, <laughs> right, because they wanted some. But <laughs> I remember Sabu would always tell me, "What do you got?" And I go, "So you don't care if it, if it." I, I would tell him, "Do you want something to bring you up, to bring you down? What is it that you want? Okay. Whatever you got." You know, he didn't even care. He wouldn't even look at it. I was like, "Wow!" But anyways, uh, Chris, it's been great having you on here. Finally. We now consider you a friend of the show. Uh, the guy that you referred to as Nick Aldis, he's on this show referred as Nick on probation Aldis. Okay, he's also on the disco list, which is something you don't want to be on. And um, uh, just wanted to say, is there anything that you want to plug? NWA, where it's at, what you're doing there, your Twitter, your IG, whatever you got going on. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely plug uh, my Instagram is ChrisMasters310. Right. Twitter is at Chris Adonis. And uh, NWA will be down in Chicago on, uh, what is it, the 5th and 6th of next month. And then obviously in August, we have NWA 75 in St. Louis. And then you'll see all my bookings if you follow me on Instagram because I promote everything. Joe just texted me that if on your IG you have any nudes. Uh, ah, you ah, ah, hands, you know. It, uh, you if, if he wants, if he wants, I can maybe, you know. Put it up as a story there you or go, Joe. There you, you could have asked him yourself. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You know, I guess- uh, all right. Well, he did, he, did, he did slide into my DMs for this, so I guess that's, that's what. So, was, yeah, that's a, that's how it starts. That's how it starts, Chris. But anyways, I just want to tell you, thank you very much for being on Keeping It One Hundred. Boom. Peace, Chris. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Thank All right. You for Be right cool, there. Chris. Peace. Yo, what up? This is Conan, and I host Keeping It One Hundred. My co-host, Disco Inferno. Unfortunately. Well, I'd say you're my co-host. Listen, every Thursday here on Spreaker, we talk pro wrestling, sports, movies, music, TV, pop culture, and some politics. It's everything the rest of the pro wrestling podcasts are not. Tune in to hear myself, the superior one, educate and inform. Tune in to hear me bury Disco. That's very disrespectful. Join us every Thursday on Spreaker and keep it 100. Boom!